This video is brought to you by Squarespace. For all of your website needs, Squarespace is the place to go. We need a little perspective here. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone of Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to talk about Sony's ultra-compact, modestly specced, modestly priced, reasonably built, including dust and moisture resistance, an exotic lens element or three, and honest to goodness, metal clad exterior, though, okay, don't get excited, it's just aluminum and it's just cladding, nothing esoteric. No excuses, dual linear AF motors, this is important. Real aperture rings, yay. And the usual focus lock, which I finally used for the first time and enjoyed it. And here's the most critical part. Very sharp and tasty, 50 millimeter f2.5, 42.5 and 24 millimeter 2.8 primes, which are uh, my kind of jam. Which is why I was happy to use them all on the streets of New York, made it to an A7R4 to create images like these. These are the full-frame lenses I've been waiting for from Sony. Not flashy, not expensive, but very unobtrusive, actually pleasant enough in hand, easy on the neck, shoulders, and back, and between the optics and the autofocus system, highly performant in the real world at apertures where most of us shoot most of the time. A number of attributes, actually, along with a couple of notable exceptions, which remind me of Leica M-Glass. Hold that thought. These lenses are so good optically that they handily out-resolve the Sony's 24-megapixel A7 III. What does that tell you? And just get better looking when you slap any of them on an A7 R4. I know, I tried them both. They are so good that I believe they are equal to or better than Sony's $2,100, 886-gram, 82-millimeter filter thread, 24-70 to 2.8 G Master, and Sigma's 800-470-gram, 28-72.8, to though the G Master's build quality exceeds that of the Sigma, which in turn exceeds that of these ultra-compact primes. But I'll take that trade. These little guys weigh between 202 and 204 grams with body cap, lens cap, and hood, and the same 49-millimeter filter thread. You have to ask yourself, especially compared to the G Master, do you really need all the focal lengths between them? And do you really want to carry that weight or incur that cost of maintaining that option? If you're an event photographer or photojournalist, maybe you do. Fair enough. But maybe you don't. How do they stack up against their natural competitors, the latest crop of small, accessibly priced primes from independent lens manufacturers? I will spare you the blow-by-blow. Blow. I will spare myself the blow-by-blow. Blow. Of pixel peeping with you through hundreds of images, JPEG and RAW at various shutter speeds, apertures, ISOs, focal lengths and focus points, I shot and reviewed, all of which told me what my eyes already had seen and my body had already felt. Simply put, they feel better in hand and optically outperform their Samyang and Tamron counterparts less on the basis of sharpness than on distortion and chromatic aberration, though the Sonys are notably more expensive. 
I'll take that trade too. I did do my testing with lens corrections turned on, by the way, because unless one is shooting video, there's nothing short of a disaster that can't be fixed in post. And I'm willing to accept that trade as well, given what these lenses can do for me, especially at this price. The closest and most satisfying competitor to these little guys is Sigma's outstanding eye series, about which I recently waxed poetically, and are priced within 100 bucks of the Sony's either way. There's not much daylight among them optically, though I'd definitely give the nod to the Sony's for weight and autofocus performance, the nod to Sigma for build quality, handling, and marginally superior chromatic aberration control. And then, I want to share with you this. In comparison to another one of my favorite lenses, and a benchmark against which all others were measured for decades, like as legendary Summicron M50mm f2, I'd have to give the nod, just and only when pixel peeping, to Sony's 52.5 wide open for sharpness, the nod to the Summicron, interestingly enough, for focus breathing. Depending on which image I was pixel peeping, sometimes the Sony looked cleaner, less chromatic aberration, sometimes the Leica. Though, you know what? One. Stop them down and you'll simply grow weary trying to tell which is which at anything remotely like an appropriate viewing distance. Actually, this is true even wide open, which is quite a testament for a lens designed more than 40 years ago versus, say, Canon's plastic fantastic nifty 50 1.82, for example, which is sharp enough, I guess, kind of wide open in the center, but gets ugly really quickly as you move toward the edges. And to Sony for bringing us that kind of performance in a package this small and light with autofocus at this price. Two, spend enough time looking not at test charts, but real three-dimensional things, and you'll come to realize the small, very small differences in things like perpendicularity of the sensor plane to the object, field curvature, copy-to-copy lens variation, focus points, shutter slap, and I'm sure there are more, but that's all that occurs to me off the top of my head, can and will often play a bigger role in sharpness achieved in the real world than the lens design and materials themselves. Though, okay, I have to mention that I also had Sigma's monstrous 1.2 kilogram 40 millimeter f1.4 on hand, and that just dusts all of them for fine detail. If you can get all of that other stuff sorted. But who the f- wants to carry that bad boy around all day long on the street? But before we consider that or anything else, I want to give a shout out to our friends at Squarespace for making this episode possible. There's a reason why I've used Squarespace for more than five years now, and why I always recommend it to anyone looking for a beautiful, powerful, and performant, easy to use and cost effective web presence, as in pretty much everybody. It just plain works, no website administrator or programmers needed. And it is so fully featured without being overwhelming that it can quickly and easily grow with you as your business needs evolve. Elegant design templates, custom domain names, e-commerce appointment setting, shipping and email integrations, plus SEO, social media, and analytics, Squarespace really does have it all. And we use it all. So if you're thinking about creating or refining your online presence, check them out at www.squarespace.com slash hue for a free, no credit card needed trial. And if you decide to move forward, save 10% at checkout by using the discount code hue. Thanks, Squarespace. Here's the thing. Finally. Sony is no longer asking consumers to choose between a high-performance, high-build quality, and high-priced lens on the one hand, something like the $1,300 Sony Zeiss Planar T-Star FE 51.4 ZA they released back in 2016, and the No Frills, No Thrills $250 FE 51.8 they released that same year. This is a big deal. I know, the 85 1.8 is great for the price, as is the relatively new 35 1.8, but these guys are smaller less expensive, and have some personality. These lenses are for enthusiasts and pros in their own right, especially for travel, street, documentary, but they are also gateway lenses, a competitive response intended to blunt defection to independent lens manufacturers who have upped their game dramatically over the last decade. They may therefore appeal to a number of segments. First, Current Sony APS-C camera owners. These lenses don't make you feel cheap. They don't make you feel like you've made an unholy compromise that you'll have to rectify as soon as you win the lottery. An investment in one of these lenses now, while still shooting with a Sony A6 series camera and contemplating a move to Sony's full-frame offerings, is, one could argue, a much easier sell than forcing folks up into big, heavy, expensive, holy trinity full-frame zooms or wicked-fast, uncompromised primes on the one hand, 
or ponying up for something like Sony's more than twice the price at $1,300. More than twice the weight and less shallow wide open too, crop sensor only 16 to 55 2.8 on the other. Remember, a full frame lens with a maximum aperture somewhere between 2.5 and 2.8 is an APS-C equivalent of between 1.7 and call it 2.0. Carrying less on your shoulder at any one time, these lenses are so small that you can put them in your pockets, is a big deal, too. Yeah, I'd bring a small shoulder bag anyway. Two, non-Sony full-frame and medium-format DSLR owners. They may be thinking about a switch to mirrorless and therefore a switch to Sony, but to this point anyway, may be hesitant because of the total system cost of replacing all of their lenses like for like, though heads up. Unless you're an event photographer, you may really want to rethink this. And they may be concerned about taking a financial bath in the process for a system that could end up, especially should they choose to stick with Holy Trinity zooms, not much smaller, if at all, than what they already have. Three, non-Sony mirrorless shooters. Same reasoning as for DSLR shooters, basically a less expensive way to enter the system, say, for its ultimate autofocus performance, specific sensor characteristics, superior lens selection, and, right, smaller size without sacrificing dust and moisture resistance, image quality, or feel, and a pathway to better resolution or better video when you reach these inflection points. I love Nikon's Z6 and 7 series cameras and their 1.8 Z primes, for example, but even if I give the Nikkor Zs the nod for superior chromatic aberration, which I do, it remains the case that those lenses are much bigger and Sony's autofocus is still better. It is further the case that Nikon doesn't have an answer to the A7S III or the A7C. Not really. I love the L-mount system, but L-mount bodies aren't close to matching Sony's autofocus performance. They are save for the Lumix S5 and the Sigma FP, much bigger and heavier. And lens selection, though much improved, still lags Sony at the margins. For some of us, these Sony Ultra Compact Primes will be the tipping point. I can tell you, shooting on the street this past week with these guys and an A7R4 was like carrying nothing. It was so light and whip fast with results I really liked, including the ability to crop the crap out of an image, which I did. I love Fujifilm, full stop. An X-T2 rekindled my joy for street. The GFX 100S is amazo in that context, too. But Fujifilm APS-C shooters wanting more megapixels, shallower depth of field, or better low-light performance than what they already have may not want to sign on for the cost or weight of the medium-format GFX line. It would take time getting used to Sony's manual of arms and colors. I know, I know. But for some Fujifilm shooters, it might be a price that makes the most economic sense. And then again, that just may be a bridge too far. In the end, I think these lenses are more innovative than Sony's just released 51.2. Yes, the 1.2 is performing. Yes, Sony has priced it aggressively. Yes, it autofocuses much faster than Canon's RF 51.2. Yes, they've managed to make it smaller and lighter too. And it has the same kind of concave front element that Fujifilm uses in its 51.0. Cool. But that's all about innovation in execution, not in substance. Of course, you can argue that a 52.5, 42.5, or 24 3.5 are hardly innovative, maybe even a little boring, slow. I understand, but I still disagree. I don't think they're boring at all. They are all that photographers who carry cameras for hours on end and want the shots, not the specs, actually want or need excellent image quality at the settings they use most often in the smallest, lightest, least expensive package feasible with maybe just a little bit of flair. Not a lot, but a little. And for that, no kidney sales need be considered. I don't know about you, and reasonable people may disagree, but I know how often I shoot what lenses wide open, and a 1.2 or 1.4 just aren't worth it to me in terms of price or size or weight 99.9% .9 of the time, and that is an actual EXIF-backed statistic. You want to shoot portraits day in, day out? You'll usually be shooting somewhere between F2 and F4. Shooting street like we do? Usually somewhere between F4 and F8, though I confess I do like my F2. Landscape? Usually somewhere between F8 and F16, F22 or F32, if you're using a medium or large format camera. And while I am not above spending what some would consider a load of money on gear, 
I'd rather allocate funds to travel, education, my family, investments. You get the idea. I think Sony's innovation here is going back in time to take a page out of Leica's playbook. They are finally building and selling smaller, less expensive, still highly performant lenses with far fewer excuses for convincing one's self to buy up. Do I wish chromatic aberration were even better controlled? Yes, but let's not get piggy. In the real world, there is good or better than what I've seen from most of Sony's more expensive primes. And as I said earlier, I'll take that trade off, especially since I shoot mostly black and white. And I can correct most of it in post when I don't, except when it comes to video. But if the substance of what we create and ask people to watch in video or film is compelling, especially given the inherent movement and the basic understanding of a DP's first responsibility, which is reducing the dynamic range of a scene so that there aren't those kinds of problems, the level of CA present in these lenses is just not a big issue for us. It would be, just for the principle of it, if they were much more expensive. Or if I were shooting video and didn't have the wherewithal to control the light or the scene. Do I care about focus breathing? Not with these lenses, not for street photography or travel photography, any kind of photography. Though for the video we do, it still wouldn't matter because we don't do focus pulls. Do I wish the manual focus ring had a better weight and feel to it? If I thought I'd use it, yes, but the autofocus is so good, I know I wouldn't bother. I do wish the lens's controls were slightly bigger. The focus hold button a little bigger and located perhaps 45 degrees left at 12 o'clock. The AF, MF switch a little bit bigger and higher too. I found it easier to manipulate the focus and aperture rings on my Sigma DGDN 24, 35, and 65. And this, to me, over the course of a couple of hours, was a material difference. Though, to be fair, that Sony autofocus, that 5.7 million dot EVF, and the exposure compensation dial right under my thumb cover a multitude of ergonomic sins. Which changes nothing really about what I said at the beginning. I think these are compelling little lenses in the real world. I think they are going to be a big hit. And I think they will drive more people into Sony's full-frame ecosystem. Makes you wonder what an A7 IV, and for me especially, an A7C II will bring. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. For all of your website needs, visit www.squarespace.com slash you for a free, no credit card needed trial, and when you're ready to move forward, save 10% by using the discount code HUE at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below, picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com, sending coffee money via PayPal, or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.